Good evening and welcome to the September 9th meeting of Glendale City Council. May we have roll call, please? Council members Devine? Here. Friedman? Here. Njarian? Weaver? Mayor Sinanian? Here. Today's flag salute will be led by Council Member Laura Friedman. Please rise and join me in renewing our pledge to the flag. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God. God. Justice. Remain standing for this evening's invocation. This Thursday, we mark the anniversary of the tragic events of September 11th, 2001, when so many Americans died from acts of terror launched on the shores of our country. As we approach another anniversary of this tragedy, let us bear in mind the work that still must be done to ensure a lasting peace around the world. We pray that the souls of those whom we lost on September 11th are sheltered and rest in peace and ask that comfort be given to those whose hearts still ache, the parents, spouses, siblings, children, and friends who keep their loved ones' memories alive as a legacy too precious to let go. We ask that the first responders who committed their own lives to danger to save those in harm's way be looked after and be blessed as they spend their lifetime healing the scars and wounds left behind by their experiences. Most importantly, we pray that no one forgets this tragedy, that we spend our days not finding ways to divide ourselves along political lines or between an ideological divide, but we convert ourselves to peace, understanding, and love in our own community and the city of Glendale and beyond this evening and always. Amen. Amen. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I don't think I've ever commented on an invocation before, uh, but I'm going to. Um, last night on HBO, my husband and I watched a new documentary that they're airing about New York firefighters. Uh, I recommend it highly. Um, it talks about many years of firefighting tradition in New York City, and they do, of course, spend quite a bit of time with 9-11. But if you ever wonder what goes into the job of being a first responder and how difficult that job really is, not physically so much, but that's part of it, but mentally, certainly, and the trauma that those individuals who live through 9-11 and were first responders are going to, it's very, very eliminating. You know, if, even if you think you know about all that, to actually hear it firsthand from those individuals is a very powerful experience. So I recommend it. It's running on HBO. I'm sorry, I don't know the name, uh, but Steve Buscemi, the actor, um, is the, uh, made the movie, and I didn't know this, but he had been a firefighter in New York. Uh, so he kind of goes back to his fire station. So. Thank you, um, Mr. City Clerk, for the invocation and for the reminder about 9-11. And I hope some of you watch it and let me know what you think. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. And I, I, I join in that recommendation. Uh, what's next? May we have the report, please? The agenda for the September 9, 2014 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Thursday, September 4, 2014, on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Thank you. Next. Next item under presentation and appointments at 3A is the agenda preview for the meetings of Tuesday, September 16, 2014. I understand this is going to be very short. Yes, it is. Okay. Mayor Sinani and members of the uh, City Council, for September 16th, we don't have any afternoon uh, agenda items scheduled at this time or any evening items for the City Council meeting. So at this time, the meetings would be canceled. Thank you. And, and I know that uh, there, there are individuals out there that sort of complain about not having regular weekly council meetings and uh, believe me we, we miss everyone as much as everyone else misses us but uh, this is the right thing to do in order to preserve uh, city's resources uh, unless there is enough uh, on the agenda and we will be certainly missing one of the council members also next week even if we were to have a meeting so we'll postpone uh, the meeting until the week after next September 23rd yes thank you Next. The 3B is a proclamation designating the month of September 2014 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Yes, thank you. And um, I do have the proclamation, which is a very important one. I, I, I want to read it out loud. I understand that there's no one here to receive the proclamation on behalf of the American Cancer Fund. So this proclamation will be shipped to them uh, once it's entered into the record. Um, and uh, the proclamation reads, whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection report cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children between infancy and age 15. 
This tragic disease is detected in more than 15,000 of our country's young people each and every year. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provide a variety of vital patient psychological, I'm sorry, psychosocial services to children undergoing cancer treatment at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, the City of Hope, Mattel Children's Hospital at UCLA, LA County USC Medical Center, as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life for these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection also sponsor courageous kid recognition award ceremonies and hospital celebrations in honor of a child's determination and bravery to fight the battle against childhood cancer. Now, therefore, I, Zara Sinanian, mayor of the city of Glendale, do hereby proclaim September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. I don't know if any of my colleagues would like to express themselves on this issue. Um. I mean, it's such a difficult thing to even think about of a child having to go through something like cancer treatment and the threat to a child's life. And as a new mother, I mean, I can't think of anything more horrific. There's someone I'm friends with on Facebook who just found out that their grandchild has cancer. And, oh, my God, it's just such a hard thing to, to learn about. So my heart goes out to anybody affected by childhood cancer, um, the children themselves, their family, and everybody else. And... Um, the only, I guess, good news is that childhood cancer treatments have come such a long way, uh, particularly the blood cancers like leukemia, which used to be a death sentence and now are much more treatable. So right. hopefully as time goes on, they'll be able to cure more and more of these childhood cancers. Yes. Yes. Mr. Um, I'd just like to say that we're very, we should all be very thankful that we have the American Cancer Society, in places like the City of Hope, where children can go to get treatment and, uh, and survive. Um, I know that in the past I was a volunteer at the City of Hope for many years, and also on the board for the Desi Giesman Foundation, which helps uh, kids and their families who are going through cancer. And I know how important it is to have support groups, to have people that support the families, and of course, that support the children. So um, I think the proclamation is, uh, is very, very uh, relevant. Thank you. It's thank you, thank you, uh, Council Member Devine. And it is very relevant. It's a small token effort by the city of Glendale to raise awareness about um, childhood cancer. Again, it's, it's a very heavy subject to to talk about and express, especially, especially, especially for those who have uh, little children. So uh, this month is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Glendale. Mr. Clerk, what's next? Next item on the agenda is the consent items, including minutes following our routine and may be acted upon by one motion. Any member of council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so Bless by you. making such requests before a motion is proposed. Bless you. And I don't see any of my fellow council members wishing to pull any of those items. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. May we have the roll call, please? Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Najarian? Weaver? Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Next item? Next item on the agenda is city council and staff comments. Who'd like to go first? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Sure, we have a fairly short agenda tonight, so bear with me because there's been a lot going on in the last few weeks. Um, last week, several of us attended the League of California Cities conference, which was here in Los Angeles. We didn't have to go anywhere Actually, except for downtown. Us. The three of us went. Right. And um, it was a very valuable conference. And as often happens when I go to these conferences, and you know, for better or for worse, I go to all kinds of seminars and sessions and hear all kinds of new ideas about what other cities are doing, and I come back with my head filled with new ideas. So I wanted to bring some of these up um, for my colleagues' uh, input to see whether it's something that we should, you know, formally ask the city to look into. Uh, first, I met a vendor that has a, a service, an online service, and I'm sure there's more than one vendor that does this, to basically engage the public in online discussions in a formal way about issues that are facing the city. 
And unlike some of the other websites that do this, things like Nextdoor, which many of us are on, um, this is something that's formal in terms of people who want to leave comments have to give their names and phone numbers and their addresses. So even though that's not posted, we know that we're getting real comments from real residents. People can't kind of game the system by posting 30 times so you don't get three, you know, one person who's against something but looks like a million people are against it because they comment over and over again. It also allows you to be specific about where you take the comments from. So if you have an issue that only affects three blocks, you can limit it to where only the people who live on these three blocks are able to give input. <coughs> um, several cities have used this site and had very good comments. They say that it, there are a lot of people out there, as we know, who want to comment but who don't want to or can't attend city hall meetings or even community meetings but have a lot to say. And this is just another way that we can hear from our constituents and where they can hear from each other in a more formalized way than just on a blog. So it's something that I think we should at least look at, maybe have the vendor come and give us a presentation. We don't have to do it. We could do it as a pilot program. But I, to me, it's another way that we can have, have communication with our residents about important issues. Um, I have a question. Does um uh, Assembly Mangato use this system? Uh, I don't know. System. Because I know he gets uh, comments from his constituents. I think it's a good idea because I know that a lot of people out there have good ideas and good comments that uh, I think we could uh, we can use. And so I think it would be good to uh, to look into that. I think the concept in general, like you said, is, is welcome because it provides an avenue for exchange of opinions. Uh, of course, we have to juxtapose that to any cost that's associated mm -hmm. with running. Right. That as you know that that aspect of our IDS services right. and just just see if it makes sense. And totally so, agreed, and I have so no idea what it costs. The, yeah, so. bringing in the vendor and, and allowing them to give a, give a presentation would be would, would be just fine. Would be okay. So that's the first one. The second one, along the same lines, is as using new technology. Although computers really aren't that new, but there's a lot of different companies now that are providing very in depth software that allows the public to not just look at the city's budget, but to really dive into the city's budget, to look at what the police, the, the part of our budget that goes to police, and then to look into that to see exactly where the police allocate their resources, what every officer gets paid, how many officers you have, how much goes to pedestrian safety, how much goes to speeding enforcement, really in a very in-depth way. And it's just another way that we can really be transparent, but also informative to our residents as to how we spend our money, where the budget goes. And I have no opinion as to which vendor, uh, whether we can do it in-house, but I think the more information that we can put online, and more importantly, in an easy way to access, something that's very user-friendly, very intuitive, very simple, uh, to give as much information to the public as we can. So. Um, I, I know that the city has been thinking about this, and I'd love to maybe get a report about what we're doing, how it's going to look, when we expect it, all of that, and you know, kind of give the public a preview. And um, again, again, yeah. yeah, and I'm all for it. I, I, I'm not just considering whatever cost is so that, so that we don't want uh, to implement some program to help us save money, which actually costs us more than the money that's being saved. Absolutely, and you know, with any of these things, mm -hmm. especially with new technology, I think you always need to build in some sort of metrics as to how you're going to evaluate it and make sure that you look at it six months, a year out, and say, you know, is this really adding value? How many people are using this? What does the public think about it? Is, has it only gotten five clicks? Does anybody care? You know, and, and look at that. So absolutely agreed. Next, the League of California Cities has been working for several years, evidently, on a financial health diagnostic for cities to run on themselves to really look at how healthy they are financially, how able they are to withstand recessions, um, how their budget process is dealing with all of those um, different issues. And they did this by looking at cities like Stockton and, and cities that have actually facing bankruptcy, have gone through bankruptcy, and the experts who went in to fix those cities have worked with many other cities in the California League of Cities to come up with basically a, a whole sort of audit type diagnostic that's very in-depth. And again, I'm sure there's some expense, but it's something you do in-house based on their module. You don't have to hire consultants, although you certainly could to do this if you, you know, really wanted to go there. And this is something that I feel strongly that we should do. I don't know whether we do it now, we wait for the mid-year budget, do it the next budget cycle, but we should look and see if we have any of these indicators that are telling us that we need to mm -hmm. tweak certain things, change, you know, change how we do business, um, that kind of thing. So I just throw that out there. Um, 
I also had the opportunity to meet with somebody who is uh, uh, the safety program manager for the U.S. Department of Transportation. And um, it was interesting because he didn't know about Glendale and our issues with traffic and our pedestrian safety. You know, I kind of assumed that I'd say Glendale and he'd say, oh, you're from Glendale, pedestrian traffic safety problems, but he didn't. Um, but they are very serious right now at the Federal Highway Traffic Bureau about helping cities deal with safety issues, not just on highways, but on all roadways. And I know that we've been doing a lot of looking at best practices and working with Berkeley, Berkeley and other places, but it's one more resource. Uh, it's one more source of funding that we can look at. He said they're very happy to come and review all of our plans, all of our issues, and see if they have anything to add. And since they're offering this to us, and it doesn't cost us anything, and it's, we could be the poster child for what they're trying to cure, I think we should avail ourselves of any resources dealing with um, traffic safety, and we should have them come out. And he seemed very anxious to do this. Um, I think they're looking for cities to take advantage of what they have to offer. So I would really like for us to, to have them come and give us another look. And uh, to tack this onto the conversation and um, continuing the conversation that I had with the Department of Transportation officials, which arose out of our Washington, D.C. visit earlier in March of this year, uh, where for the same reasons I, I, you know, I had questions about how the federal government could be helpful to us. And at the time, they provided a whole slew of uh, various sources, uh, funding or information that they recommended that we uh, work with, and I pass that on to our staff. And maybe we can, again, combine those and, and uh, deepen the deepen the conversation with them and see if they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. I have the man's name. He said he will come out himself um, and bring resources and um, happy to spend as much time as we need, you know, as they feel it can be fruitful. So I would like the city to take advantage of that. Lastly, and I, I thank my colleagues for giving me so much time tonight, um, I had the chance to meet uh, at the conference Richard Martinez. For those of you who have been paying close attention to the news lately, and I'm sure you all of you have heard about this, Chris Martinez was the, a young man in Santa Barbara County who was killed by a student, mentally ill student, who went on a shooting rampage and killed a bunch of people in Santa Barbara. Um, his father has um, been very active lately in trying to work on this issue. Um, he gave the speech that you may have seen where he said not one more, not one more parent having to grieve a child killed in a senseless attack by, by somebody. The result of that is a, an assembly bill, which right now is on Governor Brown's desk. It's AB 1014. And well, before I tell you about the bill, let me just tell you something about Richard Martinez. Richard Martinez, the man, the father, the grieving father who has been behind this legislation, is someone who volunteered to go to Vietnam when he was a young man to serve our country. He is a, former, he's a gun owner. He's owned guns in the past. He is very much a supporter of gun rights for people who are able to use them safely and with knowledge. Um, and I say that because sometimes there's a thought that anybody who is for any kind of gun control has to be a zealot. And this man is very much a moderate. And he... Um, uh, has crafted this piece of legislation along with a group called Mayors Against Illegal Guns, which again is a, a fairly moderate group, um, to try to keep guns out of the hands of people who clearly are a danger to themselves and others. Uh, right now under the law, um, it's difficult to, you know, have guns taken away from somebody in this case. And in, in this, in, in, with this young man, he was, from what I understand, you know, he was known to have firearms. His parents were alar alarmed about this given his history, but they weren't able to do anything. So what AB 1014 does is it allows the courts to temporarily prohibit a person from having guns if law enforcement or immediate family members, and that's what's new, are able to show a judge in a court that that person poses a significant danger to himself or others. So. The idea is that the gun violence restraining order, which is what this would create, this process would provide an opportunity to intervene before dangerous warning signs escalate into murder. So there has to be, you know, very good reason for a judge to order this. Um, so it does require a high standard of proof before a person becomes prohibited. I believe that this is very common sense piece of legislation, it's something that we definitely need in this state, and we've seen it over and over again. It's just a, a step we can take to make sure that guns stay out of the hands of people who are dangerous. 
I would like to ask my colleagues to support us as a city passing a resolution um, supporting AB 1014. It would just obviously be, be symbolic. The legislature and the Senate have already passed this legislation. It's going in front of Gen uh, Governor Brown. Now, he could sign this next week. He could veto it next week. I don't know. Unfortunately, we're not meeting next week, but the week after, we could sign this and be one of a, of a list of cities that have signed on to show their support of this legislation. I'm sure that it's a tool that our law enforcement and possibly families in our community would like to have uh, available to them. I think it makes sense. I think it's something that we should certainly do, and I think that um, we could do it, you know, in the memory of Chris Mart uh, Martinez, um, in a hoping that he really that there isn't any more of these tragedies. So, is there a second um, for discussing this at our next council meeting? I'll second. That. I'm, I'm, yes, and uh, I'll third it. Uh, I, I'm a gun owner, and. Uh, uh, I'm all for regulation. I'm, I'm for serious regulation because, again, the responsible gun owners have nothing to fear from, from regulations, have nothing to fear from having to undergo background checks. And, in, in fact, all those background checks and regulation is geared to filter out those that should not have guns in the first place. Um, so I, I'd love to get to you know, more details on the mm -hmm. bill, but in principle, absolutely support it. Right, and when it comes back in two weeks, if it hasn't been, been acted on, I'm sure the staff will give us of you know, all of the information that we need. That's all I have to That's know. all you have. Okay. Yes. It's well, divine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Councilwoman Friedman uh, mentioned the conference. Uh, it was uh, three, three days and uh, about eight hours of grueling traffic driving back and forth to the convention center. But it was worthwhile. There were a lot of good workshops um, available to all of us. And uh, uh, being a, a first-time uh, attendee, I learned an awfully lot and, and met a lot of great people. Um, I went today to the uh, grand reopening of Maple Park, and I just want to commend our uh, community service and parks department for doing a fabulous job on this park uh, to the Parks Commission, who um, always has a hand in the um, uh, the decision making on our parks, um, it's a um, uh, they've put in new fitness equipment, which is amazing. Half of it's for seniors, half of it is for teens and and um, young adults. The most important thing that I um, I heard today, and I, even in the uh, consent items that we just approved. Um, a lot of this, the funding for these beautiful parks that we have come from our impact fees, from the development that you see in the downtown. And I know a lot of people are always um, kind of uh, complaining or why are we doing this and what are we getting out of it. And may I offer this information to all of you, that they pay park impact fees. And this, these fees, these funds go to our parks. And uh, the results you will see if you go to Maple Park and some of our other mini parks, they're beautiful, uh, well attended. There were a lot of kids at the park today and adults. It was really wonderful to see. So um, uh, I, I just want to congratulate all of you uh, that had a part in, in, that, uh, in that reopening. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, I would also like to request tonight, and this is on a different, uh, a different uh, level, uh, in going around in the community during my campaign and, and even now, um, I've gotten questions about pension reform and what the city is doing uh, about our pensions. And so I would like uh, to ask that staff um, uh, do a report, if you would please, and bring it back to city council on what this city is doing as far as pension reform. Uh, a background for the, the audience, for the city council, uh, on what we have done in the, in, the, um, in the last couple of years, so people know what, what is going on, because I know there are a lot of questions, what the impact would be if we uh, decided to leave, it, or if we could leave CalPERS, uh, just a complete report so that we can um, begin a discussion and let everyone know, all of the residents that have questions about pensions in our community, um, give them the information that they need. And I would second that. Thank you. Okay. I would also. Third it. Third it. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Devine. I have a few things I'd like to talk about. 
Uh, on August 21st, I had the pleasure of attending the Seroptimist International of the Verdugos 3-in-1 event, which was basically um, a mixture of the installation of the new board, uh, board of directors of the organization, new officers, and um, uh, an awards program, a gr a granting of awards to women suffering from cancer. It was a really lovely event, very well attended. And um, the money that was raised uh, through an earlier event at Pickwick uh, Bowling Alley um, uh, it was being used for a very good purpose. Uh, all the women that received these awards were uh, individuals who were battling cancer, and most of them had families. A lot of them were very young. Um, I encourage everyone to support the organization. On September 3rd, uh, 5th, I, along with uh, my two colleagues, again, attended uh, the um, dinner uh, for the uh, Glendale Beautiful Fall Dinner. And um, it was not only a very beautiful event, uh, but also uh, th there was an, uh, a speaker that had a very interesting presentation about the, uh, the Verdugo Riverwalk uh, project, which um, actually is quite exciting if we can find the the funding to um, actually make it happen and maybe work with our colleagues in the city of Los Angeles because that uh, that that canal that river the part of the river connects to to, to the Los Angeles River and it, the city of LA should be involved in, uh, on some level as well as the state and the county um, next yesterday we hosted and council member Devine was also present the uh, Consul General of the Republic, uh, the Dominican Republic, Celeste Jimenez Peña, and uh, that was very interesting. I, I, all along, I thought that there was only one Consulate General located in the city of Glendale, and that was the one for the Republic of Armenia. And many of you can guess why that one is located in Glendale. Um, but apparently, the Dominican Republic the Consulate has moved to Glendale approximately two to three years ago, and. Um, they're here for a different reason. They're here because of the uh, entertainment industry that we have in this city and in Burbank. I, I'm assuming Burbank was never mentioned, but I have to assume that uh, Burbank's proximity house had something to do with it. So um, they're very um, happy about being in Glendale, very glad about their choice, and they're looking to get more involved in terms of cultural exchanges, maybe some sister city relationship in the future, all things that I believe all of us welcome very much. Mm -hmm. So just uh, keep in mind, they're in the 500 North Brand building. And um, I'm, next time, I'm going to see if there's a flag there. Should, there should be a flag there. Maple Park reopening. I was certainly there. Um, and um, that's all the events. But I do have a couple of issues that I want to talk about. Uh, some time ago, about a month or a month and a half ago, there was an event uh, honoring Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. And during his presentation, which was uh, very powerful, as it usually is, or I should say always is, he spoke about some of the things that he as mayor has implemented, very seemingly simple things, but things that impact the lives of the residents, their quality of life. Um, and one of the things that he mentioned was uh, the decision to start weekend inspections. You know, so provide inspections those same inspections that we all have to deal with from time to time uh, from the city of Glendale for various reasons, have them happen on Saturday so that people who are we, we have to assume everyone works nowadays, right? The, the days of moms and, and wives staying home are long gone. Uh, our, our wives, our mothers, are, are, you know, they're all working there. And uh, it, no one's home, so it's hard. It's, it, someone has to constantly take a day off or take time off of work to be present for these inspections. So find some kind of a... A solution. I mean, if LA's done it, I assume we can make that work. Find a solution where inspections are being coordinated with uh, our residents or our businesses on the weekends. Um, and along with that, I've, I've been hearing some complaints about um, the counter hours. Again, I know this is this is like a never-ending issue, but uh, again, these are this is what we're here for to provide services to our residents. Someone complained that they came to get a dog license, which is from what I understand, pretty un should be very uneventful uh, mechanical process. And they came, I think, like 12, 15 in the afternoon, and the counter was closed. They couldn't get a dog license. 
I mean, is there, is, uh, can, if we, if, if, if uh, Mr. Ocho, if you come back with something on the inspections, can we also get a little, not, not too deep, but an overview of what these uh, counter hours are and, and how, I mean, how, how we can improve them? Because it seems like a package. Maybe, maybe it, no, you you're absolutely together. right. It is kind of a holistic piece. We, it is all tied together, and, and at this point, we're 6.30, no, 7 uh, to, to noon, yeah. Monday through Friday. Um, but as part of the reorganization that is ongoing now, one of the things that we're looking at are new service models that might give us longer, uh, longer counter hours on given days, but maybe uh, reduced or no counter hours on a day, uh, that allows us to be there for longer for more people's convenience. Maybe that feeds into weekend service as well. So we're our charge to our departments is uh, everything is an experiment and everything is uh, temporary until it's not. Right. So we'll and, be rolling and, that out this fall. Excellent. And everything will bring you report. Everything's always conditioned by fiscal considerations, Perfect. and I think that no one forgets about that for for a second. So thank you. I'll, we'll be expecting that from uh, staff. And last issue, la apparently yesterday, well, it's not apparently, I, I mean, I, I received the, the letters also, as did, I think, our, our fellow council members. Yesterday, uh, the clerk's office was flooded by uh, at least a dozen letters from Glendale residents about an issue that may seemingly concern the city of La Cañada, but is, is very much a Glendale issue, at least for those individuals who live right next to La Cañada. And that's the... Um, the grant, the, the plan for uh, Sacred Heart, um, yes, a girls' school, Catholic school in La Cañada, which in, in order to access, the best way to access that school from anywhere on the east, eastern side is through Glendale. So it's uh, uh, Saint, either St. Catherine or St. Augustine neighborhood of, of Glendale. And uh, so a couple of years ago, before my time, before I got on council, apparently this was, you know, something that, came to our, to our attention because, again, our residents were going to be impacted. And um, the uh, expansion and some other issues that they're looking at are quite significant, and they would have a real impact on our residents because, like I said, the only way to get there, the real, really the only way on, from the east side is through Glendale. And our residents, and uh, I'm sure sure those, those letters can be made available. Right, Mr. Clerk, is that correct? We provide copies of them. We received a few more today. And received more today. I under the understanding that more will be coming. More will be coming. Okay, and, and I believe that they have asked, well, there's, there's a, uh, a new, uh, uh, impact report that uh, the IR that uh, we were either invited to comment to, right? We are providing a letter. We are providing a letter. I, I just want to make sure that the four areas of concern that the residents have raised are being conveyed to the city of La Cunada. I mean, ultimately, it's their decision, but they should bear in mind that they have access issues through Glendale, the city of Glendale. So one is the campus must be alcohol-free, and there's nothing unprecedented about these four points because apparently other schools, very well-known, well-regarded schools have similar policies for the same reasons. Campus must be alcohol-free, Campus must not be leased or lent to third parties for non-alcohol functions, which is apparently something they're considering. Uh, third is there must be no more than six special events a year with a cap of 500 people at those events. And the fourth is every school function, other than daily classes, that has more than 250 people, have remote parking and shuttle service, which is the normal uh, practice with their academic schedule. Uh, they have the parking and the shuttle service. So I want to make sure that uh, I don't know who's, co who's re responding to the IR, who's commenting on it. It's Mr. Hagani or from or CDD, from and we can convey certainly their points. I don't know that those specific points would be a function of our EIR letter that looks a little more globally at traffic flow and, and okay. use. But we certainly can pass along the letters and kind of summarize them along those those points. So what would prevent us from including these specific points? I mean. What are, what are the considerations? We look for for actual uh, impact, significant uh, impact. Uh, through our city. Through our city. And so there is an argument to be made, and one of the things that we're evaluating now is whether or not um, 
a, the use of the campus by a third party constitutes a significant environmental impact to our city. It has perhaps an impact um, to folks that live immediately adjacent, but on a programmatic level, on, on a land use level, it may not be uh, something akin uh, to an expansion of the project uh, by X number of square feet of classroom and the enrollment growing by a certain factor. It's more of a use versus a specific use of the actual built environment versus the development of that property to its highest and, and greatest extent. That's the, the, the differentiation that we're, we're wrestling with right now. But as a city, can't we still um, communicate formally any concerns that we have? And we will, and that's what I'm saying. We will make sure that all of those points in those form letters that we've received are uh, carried over in some way. From what I understand, these these are the points that all all the letters raise. The, yeah, it's the same letter. I it's think. the same letter. Right. And uh, again, the, the, our comments to their EIR, they can just choose to ignore it, right? I mean, it's Certainly. their city, it's their decision. No? They have to give a response to those comments. They just can't ignore I, I what you're saying, ignoring. Ultimately, they're going to make they their decision. Vote. Yeah, they're going to vote how they're going to vote. Certainly. But but they have to they respond have to, to bear it. Bear in mind, yeah, well, and that's why they're, they respond to it, because they know that they're going to be impacting us. And this is what our residents ask for. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, I, you know, I, I used to live in Emerald Isle for 15, 16 years. And so it's a lovely neighborhood, that whole area, and St. Catherine, St. Augustine, lovely place to walk, but uh, I've seen what happens there. Mm -hmm. I used to hike on, 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 that, on that loop. It's, a, it's basically a loop around, uh, around the school. And uh, when they have a special event, those, the, the road gets just jammed with cars park all along. It's, it's not very safe. That's why we're evaluating if those start, larger impacts right. versus something if, small. If they start right. drinking on top of that, they have these special events where they're serving alcohol. and I mean, it can be a nightmare. Again, they're, they're going to do what, what's best for their city, but we have to do what's best for our residents. And this is what, uh, an over, from what I understand, the totality of the letters is like half the residents of St. Saint Augustine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that the support for mm -hmm. this type of language uh, is that uh, that large. I would hope that, that the council would view it as such. Uh, their council, not ours. I hope so. I hope oh, so. Yes, Ms. Friedman. Well, I think this is... Uh, if I, I'm sorry. If I may, we're forward. starting to get yeah. a little... We're starting to get a little discussion about what should be in the letter, so okay. um, my suggestion would be then the staff prepare the draft letter and send oh. it to... Okay, I, just, I have a question. Oh. It goes along with it. Not a discussion. Right. The question is, can we... Um, Assuming that this is done, and assuming that I'll have traffic impacts in that neighborhood, can we look at what those are and ask the city council in La Cañada to do any kind of mitigation should they, you know, pass this? Can we have specific mitigation requ requests of them? If the project will uh, trigger a significant impact in a particular intersection or a particular area of, the, of our city, yes, we can, requ we can request mitigation. Uh, and however, we can certainly do parking. Yeah, but the the, uh, the law, the status of the law is that we cannot, a, a public agency cannot require another public agency to impose mitigation. So, um, and yeah, we, I, yeah, I mean, I realize we can't really require them to do anything, but again, they need to understand what the yeah. concerns of our residents are. And unless we have basis to tell our residents that their fears are unfounded, I think our comments should include their, their concerns. And maybe that's, that's where you were in, at the stage of determining mm -hmm. what the... What no, where you stand depends on where you sit. And if okay. you sit right next to, uh, to the school, you're going to have different impacts than folks down the hill necessarily. Right. I'm not familiar with that, that area. I know where Emerald Isle is, but how much it's of an right area, how big of an area are we talking? Are we talking a lot of blocks or how far into Glendale does this problem creep? Well, St. Augustine is all, all in Glendale. I mean, at least the, the, the residents that have written to us, again, mm -hmm. we're, at this point we're close to, what, 20 letters? They're all, they're all Glendale residents. And, and, again, there's really no, it's not like, okay, well, they'll take another route to get to the school. It's up the hill and then down, down somewhere in La Cañada or Pasadena. There's a, there's a fork at the end, but you have to go through Glendale from the east, at least. So what's the time frame on this? I believe our letter uh, will be finalized tomorrow, and I think the okay. close is uh, end of this week. And so circulate that to council? And yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, that's all I have, so we can move on to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Clerk? next item is community event announcements. This is a portion 
of three minute community event announcements by the public. Great, thank you. And the first speaker is Andy Torosian, followed by Phil Carter. Please state your name, Mr. Torosian. My name is Andy Torosian. Thank you, Mayor Sinanyan and members of the Glendale City Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm the chairman of Lark Musical Society, a nonprofit organization based in the heart of Glendale, dedicated to promoting classical music in all its facets, from education to public performance and publication. Since 1994, Lark has successfully brought to the community 300 musical events, featuring the works of composers like Mozart and Komitas, Bach and Chaturian, and musical uh, plays like The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan. Lark has educated hundreds of students at its campus on Arden in Glendale. Lark has also published over 30 musical treatises and produced over 30 original musical works by world-renowned composers. All of this has been made possible by the support of our community members. I would like to announce that on September 20, 2014, LARC will begin a series of 100 events dedicated to the commemoration of the Armenian Genocide, the centennial of the Armenian Genocide. LARC's goal is to bring to the community events that portray our music and culture. Our aim is to demonstrate to the world that Armenians did not perish in genocide. Instead, we have risen from the ashes to form a new community, an Armenian American community, one that we all take pride in. I ask that the Glendale City Council and staff be our guests at this special event to stand with Armenian Americans in solidarity. At this event, we will present works dedicated to the concept of pilgrims living in the diaspora. We will also make the world premiere of the 100 years symphonic composition by Serge Tankian and John Sathas. I hope that you will all find time to join us for this imp important commemoration. I have brought for you brochures about the event and we look forward to hearing from you. We hope that you can be our guest to stand together and commemorate the centennial of the Armenian Genocide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Torosian. Uh, my daughter is actually a student at LARC, so I'm very well familiar um, with the organization. It, just one second. Also, uh, there's a lady behind you, Arlene the door. She's She runs the brand uh, library concert series. And maybe you should talk about how to you can coordinate a classical concert around the theme of Armenian genocide or around any theme, and uh, you can work that out and, and it'd be a nice concert. Just a side note. Sorry, sorry. No, so, I just ahead, wanted please. to say to the gentlemen and to other groups that are here, but I think this group it would actually be something that really. Um, be nice to have that on our public television channel on channel six we allow uh, nonprofits to run uh, public service announcements and you know given that it's music and it's art it would be something I think that would be very eye-catching out there so I encourage you to put something together and um, Tom Lorenz who's sitting in the back is waving his hand can give you the guidelines and, and help you out with you know how you can do that but uh, I encourage all of our nonprofits to take advantage of that. It's, it's free advertising, and it really lets the community know what's out there for you to do. Thank you. So, thank you. And um, next is Phil Carter, followed by Dadi Sharkey and Shan Sahakin. Please state your, state your name for the record. Uh, good evening. My name is Phil Carter, Malibu Pacific Tennis Courts. I don't know if I'm speaking at the right time. I'm here about the awarding of the contract for Pacific Park? Uh, no, that's the item. We'll help you. Um, Thank you. Okay. Dottie Sharkey and Sean Sahak. Good 
Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dottie Sharkey, president of Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation. We are a nonprofit uh, helping maintaining our parks and open space and also create programs for, for kids, especially uh, to do with nature. Uh, our fundraising event, uh, we're here to announce Glendale Dodger Night 2015 is in the works, but we thought we'd just give you a little idea of uh, our last fundraiser here for 2014. I introduce Sean Sahakian, our Vice President of the Foundation. Thank you, Dottie. And first, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, and, and staff, we want to first thank all of you for your support. And as the photos will suggest, we had great representation from the city leaders at Glendale Dodger Night uh, this past month. Uh, it was a great event. We had 75 people out here at City Hall for the pre-party. Uh, and you saw we took a bus over with that group, and uh, it was a rowdy but fun bus. Um, and we actually had over 600 residents at the game. Uh, which is about 100, a little bit over 100 more than last year. So the event's growing, and we just wanted to thank uh, Alexis of Glendale for their support, uh, Johnny Harrison over there, and all of our sponsors, uh, and especially the residents, because uh, the funds that we raised from this event uh, go back to benefit the community and the parks uh, through the Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation, and we wouldn't be able to do it without all of your support. So thank you all, and uh, looking forward to Glendale Dodger Night 2015. All right. As soon as we get a date, we'll be back to announce it. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next is Sam Genoway. I'm sorry, I couldn't read the spelling. I apologize. Followed by Arlene Vador. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, City staff. Hi, Scott. Hi, Sam. And uh, the good people of Glendale. My name is Sam Genoway, and I'm with a firm called KPNA. We're a planning firm, and we're very excited to be working on the Glendale Riverwalk project. We'd like to invite all of you to come to a community workshop that's going to be taking place on September the 11th. Thursday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Pacific Community Gyms Gymnasium. Uh, it'll be an interactive workshop with the focus mostly being on the bridge that will be connecting the one path to another. Another. For those who are not familiar with the project, there's the first phase was instituted in 2012. The Glendale Narrows River Walk is a unique community amenity that'll increase access for residents and visitors into the LA River and Griffith Park. It'll improve connectivity and safety to bicycle, pedestrian, and possibly even equestrian paths. It will also provide a gateway to the Grand Central Creative Campus, the River Glen Opportunity Area, and the San Fernando Creative Corridor. It's a very exciting project. Ultimately, it will have two new parks, a couple of bridges that we'll be discussing, connecting the various paths, and the increase of the one-mile pathway. So we'd like to invite everyone. This will be the first of three workshops, September 11th. Subsequent workshops will be on October the 29th at the same location, and also on December the 11th. If there's any questions, there is a website on the city's website with more information about the project, and we hope to see you all there. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, Mr. Genoway. Is that a question? Well, I just wanted to yeah, make common. a point. Well, first of all, this is wonderful. I'm so excited about this project. I've You're been excited good. about this bridge for years and can't wait to <clears> see it happen. We've been informed, council, by the city attorney that we can't have a quorum at these meetings. Yes. So I want to let the public know that when you don't see all of us there, that we've been instructed to stay away, and that's the case with any public meeting that involves people talking about policy, the council being there, so we can only have two of us at all of these meetings. So when you don't see us, we're there in spirit, but we cannot legally be there in body. Fair enough, and we'd like to see all the public come out because it's your amenity at your parks. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Genoway. Thank you. Arlene Vador, followed by Ron Farina. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Arlene Vidor. I'm with the Brand Associates. We're the nonprofit support group that supports the Brand Library, arts events, cultural events, history, everything. Uh, we usually don't make announcements here because the Brand has so many events that's just impossible to keep up, but I really wanted to do this one. On September 11th, there's something for everybody. Uh, we're going to be hosting a film at 7 o'clock this Thursday, September 11th. The name of the film is Unfinished Spaces. It's a really, really interesting story about the art schools that Castro and Che Guevara imagined during the revolution. Uh, they hired three visionary architects to make them happen. And then they declared them irrelevant and unnecessary and sent them on their way. Um, these architects eventually came back to Cuba and if you want to see what a planning process that took a very big detour looks like, um, this is a really fascinating film. It won an Independent Spirit Award, and it also won an award from the Society of Architectural Historians. The film's director and the president of the Society of Architectural Historians will be there as our special guests. 
Um, so it's unfinished spaces, and if we have a minute, could we could we maybe show like a quick segment of the trailer just to, you know, kind of. No tenía que ser de un pueblo de cabecera ni de una provincia, como si era de la sierra, de los montes, más adentro, de cualquier lugar. Y era un experimento hermoso. Y era una obra abierta, abierta como lo era la, la revolución. Yo canto, yo practico la música, yo forjo artistas, luego existo. The Cuban Revolution was a very beautiful idea to change everything and to have a real honest government. In the beginning of the 60s, one day, Fidel Castro decided to play golf. Castro said to Che Guevara, imagine if we could put hundreds of students of art in this magnificent landscape. I said, I want to do it, but it's impossible. You take it or you leave it. I said, I take it. And we began to work all night, all day. But another sensation I felt during this moment is the fear that something terrible would happen. Lo que pasó con Garati fue muy duro y muy justo. And then you realize that you have been accused of something. And then you realize that you have been judged. And then you realize that you are guilty. And nobody tells you. So Thursday, uh, 7 o'clock at the Brand Library. Hope you can all join us for Unfinished Spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vidor. Ron Farina, followed by Jim Nacella. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City Administrative Staff. My name is Ron Farina. I'm the executive of the Red Cross. Uh, I have a special announcement about an event that is now in its 23rd year here in Glendale. And here to assist me is Glendale's favorite weatherman, Fritz Coleman. Hi, everybody. It's your old friend Fritz Coleman from NBC4. Once again, I find myself addressing the power structure of the city of Glendale with this important announcement and an important request. Once again, I'm asking you to help me support the Glendale Crescenta Valley chapter of the American Red Cross. It is our 23rd annual comedy benefit, Sunday, October 12th at 7 o'clock at the gorgeous Glendale Center Theater over there on North Orange Street. 23 years we've been bringing comedy to this community. We can't stop now, and we need your help. The wonderful thing about helping the Red Cross is it requires no salesmanship. Every week there is another story about how the Red Cross has sailed into people's lives at the peak of tragedy to help make the transition to calmer times better. For instance, the Napa Valley quake. It really is important for us to continue our help, and we're going to do it this year, Sunday, October 12th, at 7 o'clock at the Glendale Center Theater. There's an easy way to buy tickets. You do it online. Go to American.RedCross.org slash Glendale. American.RedCross.org slash Glendale. Tickets are $25, but if you buy them online before October 1st, they're only $20 apiece. And for an additional charge, you can get guaranteed VIP seats that includes a pre-show dinner at the Phoenicia Restaurant, who has been our sponsor for many years, and we love them to death. And it's a delicious meal and a great way for you to socialize and uh, have some fun before our evening fun starts. We're going to have some of the best comics in the business, television and around the world. Please join us again. It'll be Sunday, October 12th at 7 o'clock at the Glendale Center Theater. Do it for our friends at the Glendale Crescenta Valley Chapter of the American Red Cross. And ahead of time, I'm saying I love you. Just a reminder, as Fritz said, this is uh, $20 per ticket before October 1st. Uh, tickets usually sell out, and we have standing room only, so uh, don't wait too long. Everyone is invited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fringham. Uh, Jim Nacella. And Mr. Carter will speak at the five minutes. Oh, you will. Okay, great. Hello, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. Hello. Uh, I am Jim Nasella. I'm with the Glendale Human Relations Coalition. 
Um, we're an organization that has been in existence for 20 years. Several council persons and mayors have been on our board over the years. And our purpose is to try to ensure that the different ethnic groups in Glendale, especially the kids, get along so they don't uh, get into fights and things like that. Uh, how we do this is we have citywide dances. We've had them at Giggles. Um, we have a boxers program where we bring at-risk youth into the Glendale Fighting Club. The at-risk youth love to box. Uh, it sort of gives them a different direction, hopefully. Um, anyway, we are having a fundraiser a week from Saturday, and um, we're having DJs at Pacific Park uh, on September the 20th. It's a barbecue uh, fundraiser. It's $5, pretty cheap. Uh, and you're all invited. Uh, Saturday, September 20th, between 4 and 8, Pacific Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nacella. And uh, I'll, it's a great organization. The last event I was at, we had a interfaith dinner, which was very nice. Um, unfortunately, just like the Lark event, I will miss the barbecue because they're both on the 20th, and I'll be out of town. But I hope my colleagues will join them. Did he say $5? Five dollars for a barbecue. Five Can't beat that. Fantastic, yeah. Best offer. I'll be there. Ever. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have one more speaker, um, uh, and I think it's Margie Simpkins. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of Glendale Northwest Homeowners Association to announce our annual meeting that will be taking place tomorrow night at the Brand Library. Um, our newly Appointed Councilwoman Paula Devine will be our featured speaker. And we wanted to just extend an invitation to the community at large. Please join us at 7 o'clock tomorrow night at the Brand Library. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if you caught that, but uh, I did. I'll be smoke correction. Yes. Newly I'm elected. Now appointed. She's <laughs> genuinely elected, <laughs> not appointed. Thank you. I did, I yes. did catch that, but. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So that's all the cards that we have. What's next on the agenda? If I may, before Mr. Yes. Kasakin gets to the next item, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Carter, the uh, gentleman who submitted the card, had intended to speak on item 4D, uh, which is an item that you already took action on by voting on that. Um, however, since he's here, and, he, and rather than having you speak during oral communications, which wouldn't be appropriate because it's on the agenda, uh, my recommendation, just so that we have a clear record on that item, uh, at least we have a clear record on the item, is that the council uh, move to reconsider the item and then have Mr. Kasakian read the item into the record, uh, then allow the gentleman to speak, and, and Mr. Galani can respond if a response is needed. Okay, so, we have a mo I'll motion. move to reconsider you. the item. Second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Njarian? Weaver? Mirsananian? Yes. And who will present this item? Well, I think first, uh, Artie would need to read it in the record. A 4D oh, item yeah, is Director of Public Works and Community Services and Parks regarding Palmer Park and Pacific Park Playground Equipment Replacement Project in connection with specification number 3542. D1 is a motion awarding contract to Parson Construction, Inc. in an amount of $291,041.05 plus 10% contingency of $29,104 for a total contract amount not to exceed $320,145.05. I'm rejecting all other bids. D2 is a resolution appropriating $14,845 to fund a project. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, this is the project as indicated in the title for the playground replacement at these two parks. Uh, the RFP uh, process or the bid process was uh, executed, uh, and I will turn it over to our Public Works Director, Mr. Galanian, to explain why uh, Mr. Carter's project or his bid was uh, not accepted. Thank you, Mr. Ochoa. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Mayor, Mr. Members of City Council. Uh, as Mr. Ochoa indicated, we went through the competitive bidding process. Our lowest apparent bidder, uh, Malibu Pacific, failed to indicate sufficient number of qualifying projects as was required in the bid documents, as well as listing of their subcontractors and the price breakdown that the other contractors had submitted. Again, this is a requirement in our bid specs. As well as um, we have a very important item of work, which is uh, pouring the sub-base uh, for the equipment. And they also fail to list the subcontractor uh, with a sufficient number of mandatory qualifying projects. We consulted with the uh, city attorney's office and their agreement with the uh, 
our decision, and uh, hence we are recommending to award the contract to the second lowest responsible responsive bidder. Uh, Mr. Golanin, what was that first category that you said that they missed to do? The yeah, requirement is to list a sufficient number of qualifying projects with the uh, same scope and same uh, magnitude and cost. Meaning projects that have participated in, in the past. Yes, Mr. And Mayor. And they didn't, they didn't indicate. Correct, Mr. Mayor. And rest assured those inconsistencies would be picked up, noticed, and protested by the other bidders who did comply with the Sorry. bid spec uh, if, if uh, we were to ignore those uh, once abnormalities. The, once the bids are open, are they, they're available to the public so each bidder can view? Everyone can view one another. That's correct. Okay. Very well. Uh, Mr. Carter, would you like to yes, sir. speak? How much time do you need? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, um, I have something for all of you guys, actually. Okay, real quick. Um, I'm a public works contractor. I've been in the same business. It's my family business since 1987. I've been building parks from scratch since 1990. Um, I do my own work. I'm uh, self. Self. I self-perform all my own work, excuse me. I've never done this before, so I'm a little nervous. Um, that's why there's no listed subcontractors for me, because I'm doing the work myself. Um, I don't know how we have such a discrepancy here in what's going on. Um, you guys have a job going out to bid, which is to replace the rubber safety surface and new toys. City bought the new toys. We were to install it. You guys have purchased your toys. We were told to install it. We were told by you guys via an addendum, which is in your package right there, that says the, the playground installer must be a certified landscape structure installer. I was a certified landscape structure installer. My certification has been taken away. Therefore, because you guys told me I had to list a certified playground installer by LSI, I listed Cicero Engineering, which is in your package there, which is the pre-approved LSI playground installer. And I didn't list his five references because he's pre-approved by the manufacturer. They told us in the addendum, which came from you guys, which came from LSI, this is who you can use. So in my book, they were pre-approved already, so I didn't need to list them. Um, that's number one. Number two, we did not list a Porter Place rubber safety surface contractor. That's true, we did not. We do that ourselves. Um, and if you guys would have simply called me and asked me that question, which they didn't, I would have sent you the letter that shows you that we've been a approved Porter Place subcontractor since 2004 for your approved contractor that was put out in addendum number one or two, SpectraTurf. So once I told them that, you guys, Sean Toro verified with Spectre if we are an approved subcontractor, so that did not need to be listed. I'm doing my own rubber, so I'm out on that one. The next one that he came up with, which is amazing, is that we didn't list the price for our subcontractor, which was Cicero Engineering, which we had to do because they were the installers. Well, if you look on page, I think it's F43, it very clearly says my subcontractor and his price. So I don't see how they didn't read that one. So as far as we are concerned, as a professional company that's been doing this since 1990 with excellent reputation, every city, which is amazing, we haven't worked for you guys, we were a little bitter on the new tennis courts over at the high school, but you guys never did the job, so that went away. But in 20 years, we haven't worked for you guys, which is unbelievable. I've done every city around. Everybody loves us. We're great at what we do. We self-perform. We don't have any problems. We get the work done. I'm saving you $42,000. That's how much cheaper I am than him. It says in your book that you guys have, you guys can waive any irregularities or informalities in any bids or any bidding process. This is an informality, guys. It's worth a, it's a forty-two thousand dollar mistake. It's not even a mistake. I've, I actually complied to everything. I've answered all of your questions properly. So I'd like the city to review it, look at the savings, and give me the job. Okay. I'd like to answer any questions you might have. No. Well, do you have any questions? I, I, well. Not for the gentleman, thank you, but for staff. He makes a compelling argument. What say you? Well, we can bring back our public yeah. works director to come back through the bidding process. You can sit down, Mr. Carter. Okay. No, we would like to hear have from Mr. Galani and come yeah, up to the Mr. podium. Okay, sit down. Say something. I'm, I've never done that, so. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Just, you did yeah, very well. You, you did fine. Really? And you took like what? two minutes. You said five, but you I took know, two. I know. Yeah, sorry. Did you, hear, did you hear Mr. Uh, Connors' points? Could you address them, please? Mr. Mayor, a member of the City Council. Carters, uh, sorry, Carters. Yeah. It's a state, and Mr. Garcia will confirm that. It's a state contracting 
law requirement and as part of the uh, public bidding process and in order to create a uh, uh, level playing field, all those documents need to be submitted as part of the bid package. It is not the agency's responsibility to call the contractors with missing documents to say, you're missing this document, can you submit it now? Uh, that goes counter to, uh, as I said, the level playing field. Because the other more, contractors have submitted them. Was it more, I mean, his argument, is, as far as I understood it in those very fast two minutes, was that he didn't give you the list of subcontractors because he doesn't use subcontractors. So that's, I mean, so what was he missing? I have to check with my staff on that, but that's one of the three missing documents that he had not submitted. But if he doesn't have subcontractors, it's not really missing. Or was he supposed to list himself as a subcontractor? Uh, he is supposed to list not applicable or done by self. So we have no way of knowing uh, unless we pick up the phone and call every single one of the uh, bidders. But that's a point that I will have to look into uh, more closely. Let me, so I, I understand the, the level playing field. It, it makes perfect sense. It's fairness. It's due process for everyone. But do we have just no leeway to to allow them, allow bidders to correct those things that are not material? I mean, then again, the question is what's material and what's not. Do we, do we don't? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, yes, we do. Yes, but we do. Okay. you, you uh, uh, mentioned the key word material, and, and I, I'll have Mr. Garcia to elaborate on that. Uh, but in, in our opinion and the city attorney's office opinion, this was not a material uh, inaccuracy or uh, and, and if I I'll just sort of emphasize the point that Mr. Glani made which was um, part of the, the a level playing field and fairness is uh, if it's supposed to be a competitive bid sealed bid nobody knows what it is if we're in the bid, if we get in the business of calling all the contractors after the bids have been open what did you mean by this what did you mean by this you really aren't <laughs> You know, from a practical perspective, you're not you're not having a level playing field. This will be a lesson, I'm sure, that the, this particular contract will learn from the next time. But this has been our practice to try to apply those evenly. Uh, I, by the way, uh, the issue of waiving, uh, you know, formalities, so we do have the discretion to do that in some cases. But where anything is material, which we believe that this is, then we wouldn't have the the uh, authority really to waive those. So that's. That's another particular point that I want to I want to uh, drive home. But again, it's it's um, each one of these were material in the opinion of staff, and then they worked with my staff to confirm that view. You say each one of these. The the three issues that were raised by uh, Mr. Galani. So I heard a response about the subcontractor. Uh huh. And what? then he claimed that he gave the references, or is he not claiming that? I was a little. He he claimed on the first one that he did not have a sufficient number of mandatory qualifying projects for the installation subcontractor, and that he believed that they were pre-approved. Uh, I believe our bid still requires us to, to provide the list of projects that that particular subcontractor provided, and that those were not provided in this particular bid, whereas the other bidders did provide that information. And I'm not sure if any of them used this row as well, but you know, um, on any of the other bids, but in any event, it's still, even though they may be pre-approved by the installer, that's just with respect to the, I mean, the, the manufacturer, it's still required, our bid still requires that they list that this particular uh, uh, subcontractor has performed five projects that are, that are comparable so that we know when we're retaining someone that they know what they're doing. What was the last one? last one was uh, list all subcontractors with price breakdown. And that, uh, that's important because um, uh, we get that one a lot, and that's really the one that, and Mr. Glenn is right, that's the one if we waive that one, we get all the other contractors going, wait a second, you guys hold us, our feet to the fire on this all the time. It's not fair that you're letting them go on this particular one. And what you're afraid of is a bait and switch where you open up the bids, you unseal them, and you know, was it an omission, was it a mistake? Well, it depends on what the other bids were. Right. And so at this point, anything you have going forward is effectively that fruit of the poison tree because the process has been executed. Um, the bids were, in fact, open. So I didn't hear a response from him on that issue. I, I, I think what he said was that since some of the work was being self-performed again, that's why he didn't do it. He didn't list it in the So even if he was doing it all, he'd still have to put, do a breakdown, C correct. correct? He would have to list it as himself. Correct. I, I feel like the other two maybe yeah. were less significant, but that one to me is significant. So 
on that basis, if there's no other discussion, I would go back and move the original, make the original motion for the lowest responsive bidder. Parsam Construction. Parsam Corporation. That would be my motion. I'd second that. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Thank you, Mr. Golanian. No, sir. We've discussed this issue. A motion has been made in second. We have to take a vote now. Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Jarian? Weaver? Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Next item. The motion was to approve the staff recommendation, sir. <laughs> sir, this, this item is, we, we, it's closed. Our attorney. Thank you. Next item. Next item under hearings 9A is Director of Community Development regarding amendments to Title 30 of the Glendale Municipal Code 1995 relating to miscellaneous revisions and minor cleanups. Uh, A1 is an ordinance for introduction. Uh, now, before we move on with A1, is it my understanding that 9B is going to be uh, continued until the 20th? Third? Yes, That's correct. Okay, very well. Yes, Mr. Ochoa? Uh, yes, sir. As Mr. Bagdikian comes up to the microphone to give you a brief presentation just by way of introduction, periodically we will do uh, cleanups and revisions of the code. We have several of them here for you tonight. Hopefully, Council will agree that these make sense in terms of providing uh, the ability to give more streamlined and efficient service to folks as they come to the counter for determinations on more commonsensical types of items. So uh, with that as an introduction, Mr. Bagdikian will give you a brief presentation on the ordinance that's proposed. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ochoa. Good evening, Good evening Mr. Good Mayor evening. and Council members. Um, this item is um, one more step in the cleanup and miscellaneous amendments to the zoning code. Um, next slide, please. So this item tonight includes minor policy changes, codifying zoning interpretations, codifying existing practices, and correcting inconsistencies and errors and titles as they come up. The relatively minor policy changes are as follows. Uh, the first bullet point is regarding the change of use and how parking applies to a change of use, in this particular case, warehousing to manufacturing use for a building up to 10,000 square feet. The code already has many provisions for a change of use that are limited in size that allows a change of use between certain uses without the parking becoming a factor and this would extend uh, that provision to warehousing <coughs> and manufacturing. The next bullet point is regarding a change to the parking requirements for private specialized education and training schools. Uh, this is specifically for schools that have a larger spatial requirement as opposed to, like, like art schools, as opposed to schools that use a traditional classroom setting with dense seating. Uh, currently, the parking requirement for classroom seating type or any school is 28.6 parking spaces per thousand square feet of classroom area, which is pretty um, prohibitive with respect when, when, when we deal with art schools. And this would allow a modification to the parking requirement for specifically like art schools and similar schools to four spaces per thousand square feet. However, it's subject to an approval uh, and it is subject to an approval of a floor plan so that we can determine that the spatial requirements are different and it will limit the use to that uh, 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 proposed floor plan. And I can tell you, as Mr. Lanzafame and I go out, I'm sure you get the same in talking uh, to uh, commercial and industrial property owners, little industrial property that we have. The inability to move back and forth between a warehousing use and a manufacturing use uh, is crippling to them in terms of getting new businesses, new employees, and new payroll into town. Uh, so again, the idea is in these very specific types of properties not to be hamstrung by an older definition as opposed to the flexibility to move back and forth in these similar land uses. 
Uh, yes, Ms. Devine? I, I'm, my question is about the requiring four spaces per thousand, the difference between that and 28 right. per thousand. That's, that's a huge It is difference. huge. There's a the 28, if you think of the 28 spaces, that is your, as Mr. Bagdikian indicates, your traditional classroom, 28 students, a teacher, yeah. right. what have you. If you go to uh, music uh, programs, art programs, uh, different types of uh, crafting, uh, kilns, things like that, you, yoga studios, you have uh, maybe less than, uh, you have a handful of students at the different times. It isn't a traditional 30 students to a teacher like you would in elementary school or a middle school or high school. So these are, are uh, outside of those more, I would classify them more as enrichment types of education versus. They would have far less, far less. <laughs> Absolutely, we're, we're probably dealing with adult students or uh, uh, the mayor's uh, children going to, to music class where maybe that tutor has four students at one time or five students at one time. That's what we're looking towards. And, and if I may point out. I'm sorry, no, no, the, the school that mayor's kids go to has serious <laughs> parking shortage. <laughs> Maybe it's a bad example. That's just there. Yeah. Uh -huh. they're, they're trying to think of ways to supplement that situation. But anyway, I'm sorry, Mr. Barbara, you can't go ahead. <laughs> if, if, I, if I may point out the dif a difference also between this and the traditional school, the 28.6 spaces apply to the classroom area, not the overall gross floor area. The four per thousand would apply to the gross floor area, which may include restrooms, offices, and other accessory ancillary facilities, not just the classroom area. Okay. So it would apply to a larger area, basically. Uh, if we continue. The first item is to allow reconstruction of non-conforming garages with an administrative exception. This is to expand on the current code that allows, with an administrative exception, the rearrangement of parking facilities, whereby an additional, an increased number of parking spaces will be provided, but existing non-conformities with respect to the, to the facility cannot be fully eliminated. This particular case will allow an extension of that to reconstruction of older uh, garages where there are spatial restrictions, but it's still subject to making the findings of the administrative exception and, the, and is discretionary. The next item is to allow the CDD director to combine the review of entitlement applications. Uh, an example of this would be, for instance, um, an application for an administrative exception to deviate from certain numerical standards in the zoning code in association with a use variance. The use variance would have to be reviewed by the planning commission subsequent to the administrative uh, uh, exemption review. Uh, this would allow the CDD director to combine the review <coughs> under one authority, and this is part of the streamlining process that we've been going through. That would be the highest authority, which would be, in this case, the Planning Commission. So the, the director would be able to combine everything and allow the Planning Commission to see all of them together, as opposed to the lower authority. Uh, coming to the miscellaneous changes, the first item uh, would clarify the language in the zoning code regarding the applicability of the floor area <laughs> ratio standards, and this applies to single family zones. The next item is to allow sound, stage, sound stages production with a conditional use permit in the San Fernando mixed use zone. Currently, this use is allowed in the remaining mixed use zones. This, this would extend the the use as a permitted use in, in the SFA museum with a conditional use permit. The next item is regarding drive-through lanes. Currently, there is one set of drive-through lane standards uh, for all kinds of uses in the zoning code. This provision is a two-part provision. The first part would allow a different set of standards for food-related types of uses as opposed to non-food related types of uses and basically shortens the queuing uh, dimensions or the queuing lines for non-food related businesses like, such as bank ATMs, um, bank drive-throughs or um, pharmacy drive-throughs but would maintain the length for food related types of uses. And the second part is to require full enclosure of drive-through lanes in the DSP zone. It's an aesthetic issue, mostly. 
and continuing. Wait a second. I'm sorry. So full enclosures for the entire length of the. Mm -hmm. You mean enclosures including roof? So you're yes. putting people in a tunnel inside. So you're going through a parking structure. You're going <laughs> through uh, inside. So it would have to be inside the the so building. It, so in other in other words, you will ha we, you will not have an exposed lane of traffic in a place where we want to really have a pedestrian-oriented environment. Instead, the cars will be behind walls or some sort of an architectural barrier so that they will not distract the... the you have to have a the, roof then, too? Yes. Or from within a parking structure. Or from within a parking structure. The whole point is to maintain the pedestrian uh, environment in the downtown specific plan area. And that includes Central, then? It would. So the Starbucks on Central that sometimes I pop through... When I'm heading south, the the drive well, the, the existing be, one would be existing non-conforming. Any new ones would be. Any new one have to be enclosed. Okay, my only concern is sitting in a tunnel with all the exhaust from all the other cars. You know how that's vented and they would have how, to. How they would be unpleasant. required to vent it and everything else according to the building code, much similar to a parking structure. Again, uh, less of a the, tunnel. I yeah. think. I'm yeah. sort of envisioning that Starbucks yeah. and what they would have to do in that location. Well, we are prioritizing, again, the experience of the pedestrians and the people outside that drive through. We are giving priority to them mm -hmm. as opposed to the person who chooses, right. like you, to sit in their car and <laughs> buy their coffee in the car as opposed to park and get out Only and buy a car. Only if there's no line. That's right. Otherwise, so I park and We get still out. prefer for people to actually uh, park their cars and, and walk to, uh, to these places uh -huh. in, a, uh, in a high concentration area like the DSB. The, the drive through at the McDonald's would probably be a good yeah. example. Yeah. Right. Have, we ever, have we ever had any complaints about? No, I doubt it. In McDonald's, I don't. Think I'm more so. of an in-and-out guy, so. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't know, okay, seems to be working. Okay, the one the. In we do get, uh, actually, well, believe it or not, we do get complaints about from the neighbors when we have drive-throughs, and especially in these areas that are next to multifamily, we often tell them that they did it by permit. But this way, we will put one layer of protection, another layer of protection. No, I could, I, I could I see. Was, yeah. yeah, I could see in a multifamily area if you're next to that. Well, I, yes, but I was talking about the indoor McDonald's, the one where you go down into the parking structure. I don't know that we've had complaints on that one. So, yeah, so I think it works. So well, I have a question while we're on questions. Um, the category clarification of floor area ratio standards, what exactly do we mean by that? I mean, I know that we have different FAR for different parts of the city, even for residentials. It varies from neighbor to neighbor, which... It's strange, but um, is that, I mean, are we going to make them uniform? Is that what's... Actually, that's not the case. The way it works now, there's, there's one single ratio that applies to multifamily zones. In single family... Single family. Right. In single family zones, there's no, there's no one single ratio. There's a ratio that applies exactly. to a certain portion of the lot, and there's a different ratio that applies to the remainder of the lot if it's over 10,000 square feet. So there are two ratios that apply. Okay, but that's uniform throughout the city? Right. So, so someone building in, in far north Glendale ha deals with the same exact ratios, the, the two ratios that you just listed, as someone in northwest? It's all in the single family zones. So yes, but that's the, 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 the having the two ratios adjust for that dynamic that you're thinking of, of a very large parcel. That's okay. why we have the two. So, okay. So, so we're not adjusting the ratio. We're adjusting to we're clarifying the way it's calculated consistent with our practice. So the way it's worded verbatim in the code now is that you would derive a combined ratio to apply for the entire lot, which is in error. And then we've gone through the exercise. It results in, a, in some absurd floor areas, which are really humongous. <laughs> so the way to apply would be to derive a certain floor area based on the ratio that applies to the first 10,000 square feet and to derive another floor area or qualifying floor area that applies to the, 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 the portion of the lot that's over 10,000 square feet and then combine the floor areas. So not derive a resulting floor area ratio to apply for the entire lot. So uh, this well, I, is, I'm sorry, that second one, I thought that's how we did it in the first place. If I could simplify this. Yeah. Let's do that. This is pointed out to us uh, by a resident, uh, Lee Torgerson, a former planning commissioner who happens to be a rocket scientist at JPL. <laughs> Everyone agreed on what the formula was and how it should be calculated. He pointed out that the prose description of that formula in the code had misleading wording. 
And that's what we're correcting. Ah, so we're not, cha we're, not changing we're only the changing the wording the way we the way we explain clarifying. it to people. Clarifying. Literally clarifying it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I look forward to reading the clarification. Uh, it's 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 in the attached draft ordinance. So okay. I wish I could give you the there. page number. Sure, give me the page number. Or you can just give it to me later. No, I, 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 I found it. It's, right there. it's on page one, actually. That's where it starts. That's where the code section starts. Let me see exactly where it's ending. Okay. It's on page two of the draft ordinance at the top. Okay. <coughs> on the draft ordinance, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll read it later on. Why don't you go ahead and... The, the, the issue with the wording is where it says... May I continue? Yeah, please do. Mm -hmm. The next item, um, the first item on this slide is home occupations. And this amendment uh, <coughs> would render our home occupation standards consistent with the state's Homemade Food Act, which regulates... Um, the food preparation in home businesses. <clears throat> the second bullet point is to allow the CDD director to approve, to approve parking reduction applications in redevelopment areas in the DSP zone. And this would render the code consistent with CDD director's authority over approving parking exceptions in the same areas. So this would extend the CDD director's authority over parking reductions. In other words, right now we have split regulations, depending on what permit you ask for. If you ask for a par parking exception, which essentially results in the same result, the CD director has the authority to review that. But if they apply for a parking reduction permit, which is a different mechanism they could apply for it, it's subject to all these other hearings. So people are always opting for a parking exception. In this case, by making this change, you'll make them both consistent, the same review authority for both. And, and, that, and that's what you meant in, uh, by no associated applications for design review? Is that what you meant? Correct. That's because right. if there is an associated application for design review of a higher authority, most cases tend to be with the council. We always package them together and the council reviews both. Uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation, and before that, I'd like to mention that the Planning Commission reviewed this amendment. They recommended approval, and staff's recommendation is for Council to introduce the draft ordinance. Question. Yes. Go ahead. Please, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> my question is, do we allow, um, with our home businesses, for people, I know that you can't retail out of your home, you can't have people coming 100 people a day coming to your house to buy products but can you keep products that you sell at your home yes that that that's possible under the um, cottage food industry regulations okay but what about everybody else yes you can uh, everybody else meaning meaning let's say you are a uh, you sell Amway can you keep the Amway products in a room in your house yes it's allowed and it's it, it's um, limited to a certain floor area of the house. Perfect. So that limitation stays, okay. with the exception okay. of the cottage no, no, that's, food industry. That's the right, right answer. I wanted to be sure that that was allowed. I just wasn't sure. So with cottage food, we allow, obviously, if you're making it at home, you have to keep it at home, right? We allow that too. Good. That was my question. And I'm ready to make a comment if you want. Please, go ahead. Oh, do we oh, have to open the yeah. public hearing? Well, let's open. Did public. you have cards? There's no card, so we're going to open it. We're going to close it. Okay, so I'm so happy to see so many of these come back. I'm happy to see all of these. We'll see about the drive through thing. I, I'm fine with it. You know, I'm just curious to see what permutations some plan is going to come in from some business or they're going to have a tunnel or something. I'm just, we'll see. But so many of these are the, the kind of thing where you do an ordinance with all good intentions and it's an ordinance like this, right? And you've got these people who are kind of out here at the areas, right, where you know they're not hurting anyone, 
but they get caught up in an ordinance that had good intentions, like the art instructor who has three people in their class and they can't operate because you want them to have 25 parking spaces. And we know about this with the wine importer who wanted to have some bottling in his business without even adding any employees. And we said, now you're manufacturing 35 parking spaces or whatever it was. And you just stop business, you stop jobs, you make people not want to move into the city to run their businesses. And this is something that will give, not in every case, but give the planning director the ability to make the findings that you're still within the confines of what that original uh, code was trying to prohibit. You're not going to hurt anything. You're not going to hurt anybody. And here's, you know, you can go and operate your business. I, I think it's, it's the kind of common sense thinking and flexibility that we need uh, in Glendale and many cities need um, to allow businesses to flourish. Um, and also in terms of some of the renovations, the one with the, the, the floor area, um, adding some floor area without having to change your garage. This is something, you know, I tried before and wasn't able to get this passed, <coughs> and I'm glad to see it back. You know, we've got some of these old homes in our city built in 1925. They have one bathroom. They have a family of four, maybe a family of five, and they want to have a second bathroom, and the city says, sorry, you have this garage which is attached to your house, and you have a house on the other side, which can never be a three-car garage, but we're not going to let you put the bathroom in until you can put in a three-car garage, and so they're stuck with one bathroom. We've seen that, I've seen that happen in our city, and it's, you know, it's, it's just silly. And so it's time to start allowing people to make improvements where they're clearly not putting another family in their house or, you know, all of a sudden going to be an apartment building, but let them live in a way that, you know, today's world allows and give the planning director the flexibility to make common sense decisions. So I'm, I'm for all of these. My Thank comment you, yes. is very short. I'm, I'm happy, you know, not having much experience with this. I'm happy to see clarification. I'm happy to see uh, some maybe consistency. And uh, I think uh, what you're trying to do is make it easier for staff and for our residents. And uh, that's a win-win situation. So it's a good thing. Thank you. Yes, clarity and uh, flexibility are welcome. And if anything doesn't work out, we'll go back to it. We'll revisit it, uh, especially the tunnel thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll move the item. <laughs> I'll second. Yes. Go ahead, please. You just need to introduce the ordinance. I will introduce the ordinance. So, introduce the ordinance. It's been introduced. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kazazian, I know you filled out a form for 9B that's been continued. Uh, and I know you have. Yeah, if you can continue it to, to uh, the 23rd. To so the 23rd without uh, further public notice. Uh, with Do we my need motion. a motion? Uh, yes, please. So moved. Second. Okay. Let's have roll call on that. Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Majarian? Weber, Mayor Sinanian. Yes. Next item. Next item is oral communication. Discussion is limited time. It's not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. See, Manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for an investigation and report. Great. Uh, Aram Kazazian, followed by Margaret Hammond. Thank you for continuing it. I appreciate that, by the way. Uh, the other subject I wanted to talk about, uh, the intersection... Will you state your name for oh, the record? Oh, sorry. Uh, Aram Kazazian. Uh, I came over here when they were doing that project on Doran and Central Avenue, the one uh, on the west side of the street. I recommended to council and the staff at the time that they should find a way to connect Doran to Pioneer to eliminate one traffic signal. That would have been a very possible way of doing it. Uh, it could have been done where the street on Pioneer section could have been deeded over to the developer and uh, Doran could have continued and circled over into Pioneer and make that intersection only one signal. Uh, they ignored me at the time. I'm just bringing it up again on record. Uh, especially with the project, the way it's been designed, where you have a separate parking structure, uh, that could have been done very easily, by the way. First of all, you could have put an entire subterranean garage, entire project, and put two, two separate towers and interconnect them with a bridge over it and uh, uh, eliminate the pioneer traffic light, which is a big pain in the neck, by the way. 
So I just want to bring it up, and uh, most probably it's too late, but I brought it up at the time, and nobody wanted to listen, so nobody wants to study that that's intersection. And I also wanted to ask that to the city manager what happened to the $4 million was put aside to improve that intersection area was done 10 years ago. Crusoe put $4 million aside to part of the American approval to improve that uh, uh, intersection of the freeway and uh, Central Avenue. I'd like to know where is that money and how it's been going to be used someday. Thank you very much for your consideration. Mr. Kazazian, Mr. Ochoa, what $44 million are we referring to? Yeah, that's later on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Margaret Hammond. Good evening. Good evening. Council, city staff, good to see you all at work again, finally. <laughs> um, my name is Margaret Hammond. Um, I'm here. Everybody loves a bargain. Bargain, bargain, bargains. Our best item in Glendale, bargain, is the bulky item pickups. It's free and it benefits the city. Uh, our living, uh, quality of living, as well as improving the value of our properties by having those bulky items picked up. There is going to be a committee and we are looking for volunteers to go around with us. Uh, and when you see these bulky items laying there for any length of time, please call the city. Five four, it's eight one eight, of course. Five four eight, three nine one six. Now the second uh, bargain, which is a terrific bargain, uh, is with the uh, Glendale Fire Department, and it's the Glendale Medic Program, the EMS. Now for five dollars a month, you can call and every member of your household is entitled to a service from the EMS. In other words, a ride to the hospital will uh, be free. Otherwise, even though some of us have insurance, I think there is a $200 they allow, but it can cost you a lot more than that. And if you don't have insurance, it could be $1,000. So believe me, it's a very good program. All you have to do is call this young lady that I spoke to, wonderful young lady at the fire department, very sweet. And her number is 818-550-5604. And the form is to be filled out. I have the form. Please think about it, especially seniors. You know, we never know when we're going to need help if we fall down or will we live alone, that we need someone to come and give us a hand to get up again. I wish I'd had it when I was ill. And one of the most best bargains is at Thrift Alley, which is uh, the Assistance League's uh, thrift shop, and it's uh, just off uh, Harvard in the alley, and uh, you get very wonderful bargains there. So anybody that uh, is thinking about buying uh, odds, I mean, I'm talking china, I'm talking crystal, I'm talking silverware, beautiful things. I mean, I know, because I work there, and I have purchased there. And you get wonderful bargains in clothing, brand new clothing, for pennies on the dollar, believe me. Uh, now, the one of the best bargains is that we have employees who are not paid. Now, by that, I mean our employees happen to be members of the Glendale Historical Society. Of course, I was a founding member of it and have always supported it. That is one of the best of all associations because it is the one that builds up our city's reputation as far as our beautiful homes, our quality of living. If you join it and you belong to it, it's the companionship and working, working volunteers uh, in that group. Now, they are going to be having um, a, a tour, five uh, houses, it's called Romantic Revivals, and uh, it's one of the things, it's $25 to members and $35 uh, for non-members. 
it go, price goes up after the 20th, I think. But these are beautiful homes. Now just think about this. this Glendale Historical promotes these homes, which in turn makes us a very well-known city, a reputation, have a great reputation, both architecturally and aesthetically and historically. Uh, people come just to see the homes from all over. I mean, not just our own people. They come from Northern California, from all other states even. They make sure that they're going to be here when they know that we're going to have a tour of these homes. And they're wonderful. If you want one of these, I will give you some to look at. And of course, we're willing to take members at any time. We have our membership um, brochures. Uh, we have a new one, actually, after many years. And uh, here it is. So, and you can join all the way from seniors for $10 and go up to whatever you like to promote the beauty of our homes and the quality of life of living in Glendale. I've lived here 60 years, and uh, I mean, there's nowhere else to live as far as I'm concerned. So thank you very much. Um, I just thought I would do my promoting so I haven't been around for a while. Just remember that EMS is the best program you can go. It's a real bargain. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, bulky item pickup also. I know Mrs. Hammond doesn't get tired of promoting that and uh, for good reason because with minimal effort, uh, all of us as residents of Glendale can keep our city clean and beautiful. So a great service provided by the city. The city is very good about actually picking up the bulky item trash. Um, so please, please, you know, go through the effort of making the phone call. And we'll come and we'll pick it up. And your neighborhood will be clean. Our city will be clean. We'll all be happy. Um, next item. No new business. Motion to adjourn. Second. And we're adjourned at 7.48 p.m.